everyone, and welcome to What's Up Doc. My name is Tia Teriak, and I am happy to welcome you here to hear a wonderful presentation today. We'd like to start off, though, by thanking the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Walker Series offers lectures on history, literature, art, and science, as well as dramatic, literary, and musical performances. Get this, all events are free and open to the public, and they're held at the Concord City Auditorium. You can check out the website to see the schedule of shows, uh, which we encourage you to do. Today, What's Up Doc is very pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Newton, Associate Chief Medical Officer of the Concord Hospital Cardiovascular Institute. Dr. Newton attended medical school at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center he completed his residency at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and then completed two fellowships, one at the Maine Medical Center and one at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Newton is board certified in cardiovascular disease. And Dr. Newton joined the staff of Concord Hospital in 1997. As many of you already have heard many times over, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for both women and men in New Hampshire. And as our population here in New Hampshire ages, those numbers increase. Here at Concord Hospital, the Cardiovascular Institute was created as a one-door pathway to serve patients suffering from a wide variety of heart and vascular diseases. Dr. Newton will share more information with you about the Cardiovascular Institute, the phenomenal team of cardiovascular specialists that we have that provide exceptional patient care. Plus, you will get some information on advanced cardio imaging. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Newton. As Tia said, I'm uh, honored and privileged to be the Associate Chief Clinical Officer responsible for the success of this cardiovascular institute that was uh, put together in this structure uh, just, a, just a couple of years ago. Uh, and it puts together uh, all of the specialties that deal with heart and vascular disease uh, all kind of under one roof. Um, so that would include all of cardiology and all of its specialties, cardiac surgery, um, our thoracic surgeon, our vascular surgery team, interventional radiology uh, that works on uh, vessels. Um, you know, it's, it's, it pretty much uh, covers the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, but the cardi cardiac, Cardiovascular Institute itself is not just physicians. Uh, there's over 160 professionals that make up our team. That's a, that's a big number. Uh, and that includes not just the physicians, but the physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, uh, nurses, uh, patient care coordinators, medical assistants, all of the people that it takes to sort of uh, bring people in and get them healthy and keep them healthy. Uh, it's quite an endeavor, and I'm very proud to be uh, in a leadership uh, role in this uh, after 25 years uh, as a clinical cardiologist. Uh, the topic today is about uh, cardiac imaging. Uh, 3D cardiac imaging um, refers to uh, techniques with ultrasound, with CAT scans, and with MRI scans uh, that allow us to image the heart and proximal uh, vessels uh, with, with 3D uh, images and resolution. Uh, it, it, it is uh, a technology um, discipline that's been developing steadily over the last 25 years. Uh, and I've had an interest in it from very, very early on in my career. In fact, the fellowship that I did at uh, Beth Israel was uh, really very early on in the development of techniques to use MRI scans to study the heart, which is uh, quite a technical challenge because it just won't stop. You know, it's moving all the time. If it would just stop, we could get a good picture of it. So, uh, so I, and so I'm going to be uh, talking to you about those uh, images and technologies because they're really kind of neat. Uh, but I'm going to broaden the talk a little bit as well to talk about some of the basics of cardiac imaging in general. 
Uh, and for today's talk, I'm going to um, focus a little bit as well on the patient experience. You know, what, it, what would it be like to be a patient going through one of these tests? Uh, because I think that's, in, in all the talk about the technology, that sometimes gets a little bit lost, and, and I think that might be of interest to this group in this audience. Uh, some of these slides you might uh, recognize if you've been to see any of the other talks I've done in the past couple of years. Uh, I'm expanding on things, uh, so uh, it, 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 if, if, it's, if you see a familiar slide, it's because the, the information is important. Uh, Tia did an excellent job introducing the Cardiovascular Institute. This is just kind of a mission statement about who we are and what we do. Uh, this is just a graphic showing the, uh, the, the professionals that are involved and the services that are involved. Uh, cardiology, electrophysiology, interventional radiology, vascular surgery, thoracic and cardiac surgery, interventional cardiology. It's quite a team so that the patient in the middle uh, you know, gets excellent comprehensive care uh, by a team that's, that, that's coordinated uh, and not siloed. Um, and as Tia said, our mission is one door access to all of this. Uh, knock on the door and you're going to get all that you need from all the professionals you need. And just an amazing list of diagnostic, preventative, and treatment modalities in this area. So I'm going to start with the most basic uh, concept, and that is that heart disease can appear in almost anybody of any gender at any time, young or old, <laughs> some that might seem likely and some not so likely. Here's the young and old Keith Richards. Here's the young and old Cher. Uh, so whether you beat up with a rock and roll lifestyle and lots of cigarettes or whether you're a fitness icon, either way, uh, different forms of heart disease happen in all, all patients, uh, and, and it's important to remember that. So identifying whether you have, have a heart condition or not uh, it's very common because the disease is so common and the worry is logical if somebody has a, a symptom. I'm weak, I'm dizzy, I'm short of breath, I'm having chest pain. What could it be, doctor? Well, it could probably be one of 20 things, uh, some dangerous, some not so dangerous. Uh, and the cardiologist gets the phone call usually very early in the game uh, because they want to rule out the bad stuff first. Um, so we're involved a lot in trying to make initial diagnoses, um, and a lot of times the answer is it's okay, it's not your heart, you know, but it's important. Uh, so ECGs are our most basic tool, and I'm uh, often, I, I find that when I'm showing people their EKG and talking about EKGs, um, it's not common knowledge, like what is that? People know the word, but they don't necessarily know what it is. And it's actually a pretty simple technology uh, when it comes to the basics. It's really measuring the millivolt signal on the surface of the skin that's coming from the electrical conduction through the muscle of the heart. Uh, and it takes very sensitive equipment. That's why you know it, it hasn't been around for hundreds of years, but it's been around for a hundred years when the technology was available to to discriminate the signal from the noise in such a tiny little millivolt range. And when you're looking at an EKG, uh, it basically has 12 leads and they're marked on there. I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's kind of 12 basic um, uh, lead marks. Um, and what that, the simplest way to think of that is what that is, is it's looking at the millivolt signal from different directions, like I'm looking from over here, and I'm looking from over here, and I'm looking from over there, kind of in three-dimensional space. So there is a very uh, specific prescription for the technician to put the leads in a certain place on the chest, and then that way uh, the cardiologist or the other physicians that are looking at this tracing would be able to look at that millivolt signal and make assumptions about the direction of the electrical uh, pathways, the efficiency of the electrical pathways, and so forth. So there's kind of a whole science behind that, and, it, and, and that's what it is. I think you should know that in general terms, the EKG can be intensely helpful in certain situations, 
but in a lot of situations it's very vague. You know, people sort of say, well, there might be a problem, there might not be a problem. And we often have to move on to other testing, more specific testing, for example, cardiac imaging or stress testing, to try to make sense of what uh, we've seen and whether that really indicates a clinical problem or not. What I put on the right-hand side of this slide are two situations where the EKG most definitely tells you what the problem is. And this one at the top here is an example of what's called heart block, which is a condition where the conduction system through the heart is not conducting the signal appropriately from the upper to the lower chamber so that it can do a nice organized prime pump sequence. And this would be, if this is not reversible, this would be something that would be cured with a pacemaker. Uh, that's a pretty definite uh, thing. The one down here is actually a classic pattern of a heart attack in progress. And we use this in the field. The EMTs can come to your house if you're having chest pain, and they can do an EKG, and they can tell, bang, right away, this is a heart attack in progress. Because this is a very characteristic pattern that happens when one of the arteries, specifically the left anterior descending artery, becomes completely occluded. A plaque ruptures, it clots, your heart's not getting any blood flow in that distribution, and the muscle is dying. Okay? So you don't want to wait, you don't want to call the nurse at your doctor's office and say, gee, I'm having crushing substernal chest pain, can I come into the office to be checked? Because I think it's probably nothing, and I really don't want to sit in the waiting room for a long period of time. And the last time I felt like this, you know, was indigestion. Well, the thing is, is that would be the wrong thing to do, right? Because if the EMTs come to your house and they see this, they know you're going straight to the cath lab, okay? Because every minute you wait, you're destroying heart muscle, okay? So that's another example uh, where it's not a, a, a general, it's definitely, okay, that's a problem. So these EKGs can be sometimes a little frustrating if it shows a little, I don't know, equivocal thing. But if it shows that, or if it shows that, it can be very helpful right away, sometimes in a life or death way. So that was the ambulance racing off to the cath lab. Uh, we have a system here with the Cardiovascular Institute and Concord Hospital where uh, the emergency department is, is bypassed in outside hospitals. The EMTs can go to, uh, to a house in, in Guilford, in Wolfboro, I mean, in uh, Moldenboro, uh, and even up in Plymouth. And if they see this, they're just going to come straight to our cath lab, and that's going to save lives, and that's going to save heart muscle. Um, this was a picture taken from a newspaper article where somebody uh, came down out of their apartment building and they were having chest pain and the ambulance happened to be there because they were called to see somebody else. So he jumped in the ambulance and drove himself to the hospital. Wow. Stolen. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> and so I wonder what happened to the person that they were supposed to see yeah, right. because they would have come out and there'd be no car. Anyway. The article said that person was okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, one of the things we often do with ECGs is we see how they change when people exercise. And this was traditionally the most basic way of trying to determine whether somebody's chest symptoms were happening because of low blood flow in some areas to the heart or not. Because the EKG will, will take on a characteristic change when parts of the heart muscle are suffering for oxygen. And that is that the waves after the spikes, the spike indicates the main conduction of electricity through the thick muscle of the heart, the recovery waves begin to flip and go downward in a very characteristic way. And so there's a whole technique of figuring out through this uh, test whether you, you think that the person is having chest pain coming from the heart or chest symptoms coming from the heart or not. And if chest pain is thought to be coming from the heart, it's not always pain, sometimes it's pressure or other things, uh, that would be something we would, we would call so-called angina, if you've ever heard that word before. And angina is really a clinical term 
There's, it, it, it's, it's, well, the doctors suspect pretty strongly that that symptom that you're having is from a low blood flow problem to your heart. So what is the patient experience for this? Well, the same as the EKG in the sense that they're going to they're gonna make you take your shirt off. It's going to be cold. Uh, and then they'll prep the skin with alcohol wipes or things like that because those millivolt recorders have to have very good contact. Otherwise, they'll shake and you'll have so much noise that you won't be able to tell what you're seeing. And then they put these strong stickers on there in that particular locations, those particular locations, it's very standardized. And then they're going to have you exercise on a treadmill. In Europe, it's more common for them to exercise on a bicycle. And there, there are clinical trials in the, in the European literature that pretty much mirror the American literature using bicycle stress instead of treadmill stress. Uh, in the U.S., you can't use bicycle stress because we don't cycle, and a lot of us don't even walk. So the problem is the leg muscles get tired before the heart ever gets any kind of workload. And the whole point here is to give the heart a workload. Uh, there's there's, there's a pretty standard protocols for what's going to happen on the treadmill, and the stages are usually about every three minutes. So they have you walk super slow for the first three minutes to make sure you're not going to fall off. Okay, and then the next three minutes, it's a little steeper, it's a little faster. The next three minutes, it's a little, is anyone nodding here? Is anybody going through this? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and, and usually in about six to 12 minutes, uh, you've got enough workload on the heart to figure out whether this is likely to be a heart problem or not a heart problem. It's not perfect. Uh, and, and in fact, doing a, a Techniques that also provide images of the heart go a long way towards improving the accuracy of this test. Uh, this test is notoriously inaccurate, especially if you can't exercise very much. And that defines a lot of the human population in the U.S. these days. Uh, and so as that reality has to be addressed, uh, you know, one has to wonder you know, how often is a test like this really going to give you the answer you're looking for? And how often are you going to need to add adjunct imaging of the heart so you can add yet another layer of confidence to whether or not you have a heart problem on your hands or not? Uh, echo. Who's had an echo? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so what is an echo? Echocardiography, that's ultrasound of the heart. It gets a special name because it's the heart, I guess. Uh, but it's basically ultrasound of the heart, and they use the same machine used to look at babies and pregnant mothers. It's very safe. Uh, it's just focusing on the heart instead. Uh, and this technology is very powerful because we can get a lot of information non-invasively with no x-ray exposure, with a portable machine if need be, about the structure and function of the heart and some measurements of the great vessels as well. The limitation is that it's ultrasound. And uh, if you've ever seen an ultrasound image, they're kind of fuzzy. Like, I don't have a movie one for you to look at, but here's some still shots. Uh, and they, you know, you get pretty good at looking at them, but they're not the super crispest, clearest images in the world. The other limitation is that Sometimes we have a hard time seeing it. Sometimes if people are big, it's very, it gets harder and harder to see. If somebody has lung disease, that makes them trap air in their lungs like emphysema. The ultrasound can't penetrate air. So you, you have a harder and harder time seeing that heart. And also you can't scan through the ribs. So if you can't scan through the ribs and you can't scan through the lungs and you're trying to look at the heart, which is right here, that means you've got to be pretty skilled to get nice pictures like that. And so the technicians have to work uh, within the confines of certain windows, as it were. You know, and that term window refers to the idea that you can't just scan anywhere and see the heart. You can see it from here, and you can see it from here, and you can see it from here. You know, 
And meanwhile, they're having to sort of get around all the other technical factors of the patient. So it's quite a skill. It takes years of training. Uh, the, if you had an echo, you met an echo tech. And that echo tech literally has years of training because they have to know what to look for, how to find it, and not only that, say they come across a problem, now they're going to have to do more things to interrogate the severity of that problem. So it has to be going on in real time in that person's head. And we rely very heavily on our techs, and we train them carefully, and we talk to them carefully, and we go back and forth and learn things and do continuing education all the time to make sure that they're getting absolutely the best information out of these scans. For the patient experience, sorry, you got to take off your shirt again. And it's going to be cold in there. Okay? And then, cruelly, they're going to put jelly on that thing and put it on your chest. Okay? They usually try to warm it up. No, she's like, no, they didn't warm it up for me. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but, but yes, yeah, so it's the jelly uh, to, to make a, 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 a contact for the signal between the skin and the probe. The probe is like a finger, you know. I guess there's not a good picture of it there. This is, this is supposed to be the probe right here. And that slides on the skin, and they'll rotate it, and they'll angle it, and they might even have you sort of, okay, lay on your side, now lay on your back. Uh, because the heart will actually sort of flop around a little bit in the chest and get close enough and so that they can see it through the right window in that area. So there's some rolling around, there's some cold gel, and there's some pressure, not severe, but you know, there's some pressure because they have to keep a nice contact on the skin in order to get that signal back. At the end of the day, uh, they'll acquire loops of pictures of the heart, sometimes 50 to 100 of them, and the cardiologist has to look through every single one. And as the cardiologist looks at them, they're going to get assessments from multiple angles about each and every one of the heart valves, the heart chambers, and uh, we get information not just about anatomy, but also about flow and function through this technology called Doppler which can give us color maps of the direction and the velocity of flow through the valve. So you can tell if a valve is blocked, you can tell if a valve is leaky. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of information about function. This is different from what I was alluding to before with the heart attack and the stress test, because those things are really looking for signs of blocked arteries to the heart. Uh, that cannot be seen with ultrasound like this. So we have to do other things like stress testing to give us implications as to whether or not there's a problem or not, and then go on to further testing um, to try to really image the arteries that feed the heart. Okay. So remember how I said the regular EKG stress test has limitations? It really does. And if you're trying to get around those limitations and maximize the accuracy of your test, there's really two other ways you can do it. One is you can marry the stress test to an ultrasound and see how the heart reacts when you get off the treadmill. And it was shown years ago that if you have blocked arteries in this area or that area, that the muscle that's under stress from that will just sit up and stop working and let the other ones do the job. Okay, so what you do for this technique is you got to take your shirt off again. It's cold. They got to put on the EKG stickers. Then they have to give you the cold gel, and they take images of your heart in these standard four views, so we can see each wall of the heart at baseline. Okay, and then the cardiologist or uh, other provider comes in and takes a look and says, well. Uh, heart looks pretty strong and even to begin with. That's good. Now let's give it a test. We'll run it down the highway and see how she does. So then you do the treadmill part. Like we were talking about every three minutes, the workload gets higher and higher. We watch the blood pressure. We watch the heart rate. We watch the rhythm. 
we look at the EKG to see if it's showing us any of those obvious characteristic changes, that there's a problem. And then when the person reaches the peak of exercise, and we have certain targets for you, so you can't get off easy, it's a negotiation. We don't want you falling off the back, but at the same time, the longer you go, the more we know, right? Because if we put workload on the heart, then it's going to show us there's a problem. If you don't, then we might miss it. So, you know, there's usually a bit of a negotiation about when it's time to stop. Uh, and we like to try to meet certain targets that have been defined in previous research that tell us, okay, if we can get to such and such a heart rate, then we can depend on the result. If it's negative, we can say, okay, it's negative. We're not missing something that's flying under the radar. And then when you're at that peak of exercise, this is a cruel test, when you're at that peak of your exercise and you're sweating and you're short of breath, now it's time to jump off the treadmill, lay on the bed, and hold your breath so they can take the pictures. <laughs> because this thing that I was telling you about, which is that change in the way the walls work, this only lasts about 90 seconds. And then it gradually starts to go back to normal. So imagine this poor tech who's trying to find those four spots and get clear images when you're breathing hard. And by the way, the image goes in and out and in and out and in and out when you breathe. So, so they have to try to find out where you need to hold your breath and then have you hold it for at least a couple seconds so we can see each part. And they got only 90 seconds to do it. I mean, they do eight, nine of these a day. I mean, imagine that. You know, it's it's incredible. And they do an amazing job doing it. But that's what it really takes, you know. And so for the patient experience, it's quick. You know, they're kind of ushering you off the treadmill and onto the bed, they're scanning you very fast. They're asking you to move in a certain position, hold your breath in a certain spot. Bang, bang, bang. But when it's done well and it's done by professionals like we have here, uh, you get a very reproducible result where you can put up on the computer side by side, here's that view before, here's that view after, and then you can train your eye to look for changes, even very subtle changes in the motion of those walls, and that's a proven technique for, for identifying the presence of blocked arteries to the heart, and not just that, you know, where is it located? How bad is it? How risky is it? There's a lot of information you can get from a test like that. So you can imagine this is great when you can do it. Uh, it's non-invasive. It uses ultrasound. Uh, it's pretty quick. You get your results bang, bang. You get functional information, like how fit the person is and how far they can go, as well as answering your question yes or no about blocked arteries to the heart, and because you're doing a survey of the heart with the echo before you start, you've also kind of got a backdoor way to know that, okay, I don't have a weak heart either, I don't have a bad valve, you know, so if you have a patient who has multiple potential concerns about issues with their heart, it's, it's I won't say one-stop shopping, but I mean it's pretty close, uh, but, 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 right, it requires that you have decent images that you're able to exercise reasonably, um, and, and so forth. And that doesn't necessarily define everybody. Take, for example, someone who's going for a knee operation. How are you going to do that? You know, so you need other ways. So nuclear cardiology is, is really the, the bread and butter of how you manage situations like that. Uh, and that is because we can get blood flow maps of the heart in a way that gives us similar information about the presence and the extent of coronary artery disease without necessarily having to exercise the patient or exercise them very hard anyway. Uh, and the principle of this has been around for decades. And what this is, is a radioactive tracer. So it gets injected through an IV and it circulates through the bloodstream and it's an agent that's designed to collect into the heart muscle according to blood flow. So the more blood flow, the more tracer gets to that part of the heart muscle. 
and then it sticks there, like iron, iron filings to a magnet. It sticks there, and then it gives off an x-ray. So instead of a traditional x-ray, where I'm shining it through your body and onto a film, the x-rays are actually coming out of you. You know, like you have a light bulb glowing inside your chest. And so now I can detect that with a camera, a very sensitive camera, that picks up those, those x-rays coming out of your body. So the agent that we use most commonly is, is, is a technetium-99 radioisotope. What does that mean? Well, it's, 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 a, it's an element that gives off an x-ray. So they take that and they bind it to an agent that will stick to the heart muscle like iron filings to a magnet. And then they put a trade name on that and charge money. <laughs> <laughs> and then they inject that and they wait a little bit for it to circulate. It doesn't just get picked up by the heart, it gets picked up by other things too. Uh, but for the most part, you can, you can then put the person on a camera system that, that looks at the x-rays coming, and what it'll do is it'll step different like angles right around your body. And then with a sophisticated computer and a technique called uh, back correction, you can create a three-dimensional model of the heart on a screen. And then you can slice it up like a bread loaf any direction you want. And you can analyze the blood flow to the heart that way, because the principle of it is the stronger the signal, the better the blood flow, right? So if you see areas of low signal, that's your clue that maybe there's a restrict, restricted artery there. Uh, I won't go into the details of how the element is made, although that's kind of fun if you're into that stuff. So we have a camera system here that's capable of doing that. Uh, and not only that, it's connected to a CAT scanner as well. And the reason it's connected to a CAT scanner is a lot of times you'll get a reduced signal coming from the heart that's not because blood flow wasn't getting there, but because the x-ray died on the way to the camera because the person's big. Okay? And so it attenuates the signal. So what happens in this system is it'll take a quick CAT scan of the chest and it will, it will estimate the attenuation in that area and then correct the image for that. So this is a way of getting more accurate, clearer pictures in these cases. So what's here on the slide, the, these are actually the transmission scans, they call them. That's the low-level CAT scan so that the machine knows how much uh, bone and fat and muscle it has. The, the x-ray has to get through to reach the camera. Mm -hmm. And then the yellow is actually the signal that's accumulating and coming from the x-ray that's in the heart muscle. And, and by doing that, you can create these blood flow maps. So here's an example of one of them here. And all this is is... <coughs> The left ventricle, which is the main muscle pump of the heart, where the blocked artery problems occur, is shaped kind of like a cup. And so if you have a 3D image of that, you can kind of turn it any way you want, right? So maybe it sits in the chest like this, uh, but you want it nice and straight and square. So you can have the computer uh, reorganize this data to straighten that thing out and then slice it any way you want. So you can slice it like a bread loaf. That's what the top images are, from the tip to the base. You can slice it from side to side. You can slice it from top to bottom. Now what we do here is just like with the stress echo, we take one set of images at rest, and then we take another set of images after some sort of stress or workload. That's how you can detect blood flow blockage or blood flow reserve problems. And you can distinguish between uh, a, a, a problem with poor signal that appears exactly the same on both phases that might be an old heart attack, or one that shows poor signal at stress that is now normal at rest, and that might imply you've got 
a blocked artery problem with threatened heart muscle. So without going into too much gory details, you know, this is a, this doesn't display as well on the slide as it did on my computer. But this is an example of where this part of this limb of the lateral wall of the ventricle is not picking up good signal. And then on the rest scan, it's, it's much better. I don't know if you guys can appreciate that. Uh, but that's, you know, I probably could have found the more dramatic example, but uh, this one happened to be in the slide library. Um, and so that's an example of, of a so-called reversible defect, which would be at the base of the lateral wall. So now I can tell the referring doctors and cardiologists that, yep, I've got evidence of a blocked artery problem. There's live muscle down there, because look, it came back to normal when, on the rest image. Uh, and it's in this location, which is typically this artery, and it's not extensive, so I can also make a prediction about risk. So that's a very powerful tool, because I get location, extents, and risk all in one test. So say that person was going for a knee operation. I can do a test like this without exercise at all. I can inject a drug that dilates arteries. Doesn't put any stress on the heart, really. And if you have normal arteries, they're going to dilate, and you're going to get even better flow to those areas. But if you have blocked ones, they can't dilate. And you're going to have relatively less signal in those areas. So this is how you can do coronary evaluations and risk evaluations with people, people that you know have coronary disease uh, without having to exercise them at all. So very powerful tool clinically if you're thinking about the patient populations that you're really wanting to know the answer to these questions on. But they're not going to run the marathon on the treadmill for you. So we do this also very commonly at Concord Hospital. Uh, oh, patient experience. This is a long test, guys. Uh, this is about a three-hour process. Uh, no, the other one. I, I, I gotta use this to back up, I guess. This thing isn't really working the way it's designed. So we have a team of dedicated technicians they're amazing people. They deal with radioactive elements. They're licensed by the state for the use of radioactive materials. It is, it is serious business, okay? And, they, and they're the ones that coordinate this and work with us and run the machines and the whole nine yards. What happens if you're booked for one of these tests is you're gonna have to have two sets of scans, one when you're resting and relaxed, and then the other one after stress either on the treadmill or by using this injection that I was talking about. So if you were to come in from home for one of these, uh, you'd have to take off your shirt again because they have uh, this tied to the EKG. They put on the EKG stickers, they put in an IV. They give you an injection of this tracer, they let it circulate for a few minutes, and then they put you under this camera and they acquire the first set of images. Uh, then after some time, you go into the stress part of it, and they do an EKG recording while they're giving you the vasodilator or while you're doing the treadmill part. And then at the peak of stress or dilation, they give a second dose of the medicine, and then they let that circulate for a little while, and then they put you under the camera again. And you don't get your results right away. The cardiologist isn't going to be, oh, here's the problem, because... Those images have to be processed, they have to be, you know, printed or published and sent for the cardiologist to review. So you would go home after that process and you would hear about the results later. Anybody been through that one? One. Okay. All right. Transesophageal echo, what is that? Well, remember how I was talking about uh, sometimes with the echo images, it can be challenging or difficult to get good images because of the limitations of the windows, the bones, the air, and so forth. Uh, sometimes uh, we can get information very clearly if we could only have the ultrasound probe behind the heart where there's no air or bones in the way instead of in front of the chest. And so this technique of transesophageal echo was developed for that reason. 
And what you can do is you can mount an ultrasound probe on the tip of one of these scopes that they use to look in the stomach for ulcers. Um, and that's basically how it was done. Uh, and so instead of a fiber optic scope where you're going to see the inside of the, of the, of the, the esophagus, it's an ultrasound probe. It's a high resolution probe because it doesn't have to scan very far to see what it needs to see, so that's an advantage. And there's great contact. You don't have to use jelly. And there's nothing in the way. You don't have bones or air in the way because the heart actually happens to sit kind of right on top of the esophagus uh, about midway down. So what's the patient experience? Well, we got to snooker you out, right? you're probably not going to like swallowing that. Has anyone here had a transesophageal echo? Has anyone here had an endoscopy? You know, to look for ulcers, one person. Uh, so the patient experience is you come in and, uh, and they prepare you for this. They, we usually put in, an, we put in an IV and we give sedatives so that somebody is nice and relaxed. Oftentimes we'll also have the patient swallow some lidocaine jelly to numb up the back of their throat. And once they're nice and relaxed and sedated, it's actually pretty easy to slide the probe down the esophagus. And once you're about halfway down, you get these beautiful, as far as ultrasound is concerned, beautiful images of the heart, especially the left-sided heart valves, if you're ever concerned about problems with that. And we can get much more confident information in many cases about whether valves are leaky, whether valves are blocked, whether valves are infected, uh, whether there's holes between the chambers of the heart, lots of different indications for this. Uh, typically, when you're not getting what you want to be getting with the regular ultrasound, it can be a powerful technique. Uh, one of the images I've shown here is actually an ultrasonic three-dimensional reconstruction of the mitral valve. So pretty awesome stuff for understanding diseases of the mitral valve. That's one of the left-sided uh, valves of the heart. Uh, here is a left atrial appendage. That's a little dead pocket at the top of the left atrium. People who have atrial fibrillation, anybody here have atrial fibrillation? It's very common. Okay. People who have atrial fibrillation have sort of a wiggling of the upper chamber, and so the blood can stagnate in this little dead pocket up at the top of the chamber, and if it does, it can coagulate. And here's the only way to see that is with this esophageal echo technique. So if we really want to know if a clot has formed in that location, we can do a test like this and see yes or no, is there one there? That can be really important because if that piece breaks off and flies up to your brain, you'll have a stroke. So if there's a question about the presence or absence of that and the indication for doing something about that, that can be very helpful information. So transesophageal echo is commonly done in that context. If you had a clot, could you get it out? No, you usually don't. You usually start a blood thinner and it'll dissolve on its own. Uh, this technique has been used mostly to accelerate cardioversion. I don't want to get too off topic, uh, but if somebody has AFib and it's really bothering them or their heart, there's a way to kick the heart back to the normal rhythm called cardioversion. Well, you wouldn't want to do that and shake that bad boy loose. So if the person hasn't been on blood thinners for very long, instead of putting them on blood thinners and waiting two months, which is what we used to do in the old days and they'd be miserable the whole two months, uh, we can accelerate that whole process by doing the esophageal echo, and if there's no clot, you can do it right now. And save a lot of time and trouble and suffering. So that's a, a very common indication for that particular thing. All right. Okay, 3D cardiac imaging. How am I doing for time? Almost out. Okay, sorry guys. All right, CT. Uh, CT cardiac imaging hasn't been around a whole lot of time uh, because it's very technically demanding to the machine, uh, not to the patient. Uh, but it has been around for probably 20 years or so. Uh, and 
uh, it had very limited usefulness at first because it's very difficult to actually freeze motion uh, with machines uh, like that through a large volume. A CAT scan can easily take a picture in 3D if something's not moving. If something's moving, it's it's kind of it's kind of tricky. Um, and so, but over time, a lot of those technical um, things have been solved, and we can now pretty reliably get three-dimensional images of the heart with a CAT scan. Uh, that can be used for a number of things. It can be used to look at anatomy of the heart in very fine detail with images that are crisper and more confident than you might get with echo or nuclear images like I've shown you even with transesophageal echo. And uh, we can also look and study, uh, in some cases, the arteries that actually feed the heart, where normally that takes an invasive test called a cardiac catheterization to do. Uh, it doesn't work for all patients or all situations, uh, but there are some examples where it does perform beautifully for that indication. Here's an example of a person with a, with a mass inside their heart. See this baseball right here? That, that's an abnormal tumor that's in the left atrium, one of the chambers of the heart. Uh, here's how it would look on an echo. And uh, I think the idea here is you can sort of, you can see it, but you can sort of barely see it. And plus, you're going to be limited in terms of really evaluating the size and the nature of that because of the limitations in the windows and the three-dimensional aspects. Here's an example of a CAT scan that would be done like a standard CAT scan without all of the tricks and tools that we've developed to look at the heart with CAT scans over the last 20 years. The heart is just like a gray blob. You really can't see anything at all. You can't really say much about it at all. Uh, here's an example of using all the tricks and tools to scan a heart uh, with, with the modern technology, and here you can see very clearly the size and the extent and the location of this mass in the heart. Uh, and this, the, these machines will return to you a data set where you can take slices of the heart like in half a millimeter, half a millimeter imagine that, and you can scan through the heart in any direction. So it's almost unlimited in terms of how uh, detailed you can be about identifying and uh, describing some of these types of lesions. Uh, these machines are quite technical. Uh, the newest machines have wide detectors, which means they can take uh, an image of a wide slab of the heart all at once. Uh, they spin like crazy. Uh, this is actually a picture of one working with the covers off. You know, so when you go in there and get a CAT scan, has anybody had a CAT scan? I have. CAT scan. When you have a CAT scan, uh, you can hear the machine. You can sort of hear it going, you know, you're not really sure what that is. But if you were to take the covers off, you have all this equipment spinning at like 20 G. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's crazy, the engineering that it takes to even do that, and for that to work horse for you day after day, year after year. Uh, as it spins, it's creating an x-ray at the tube that's spinning, and it's detecting the x-ray as a shadow, as it shines through your body on the detectors on the opposite side. That's how CAT scans work. And then through a lot of computer re reconstruction and algorithms, you can derive a three-dimensional image based on that data. Uh, and the original CAT scanners uh, were pretty simple, and now they've just become more and more complex, giving us more and more capabilities. If you had a single slice and you wanted to scan the body, you'd have to sort of spiral your way down. And that's still true to some extent, but these multi-slice scanners, the one we have now is 256. So it's a, it's a big, wide swath that you can take. And in this case, in cardiac imaging, it's critical because if the swath is big enough to cover the whole field of the heart, then you can do that in one spin. And if that thing is spinning like the picture I showed you, it's like freeze frame 
photography, you're almost able to freeze frame the heart even though it's still beating. In the older scanner, it took us about four spins, maybe five, to get through the volume of the heart. And meanwhile, the heart's beating. And so imagine that poor machine had to figure out how to deal with that. It, it would take the EKG signal, it would try to figure out, well, here's how I have to reorganize this data to try to stitch this thing together to make a heart for you. It's pretty amazing what it did, but it required a lot of technical feats to do that, and so our newer scanners are, are getting better and better at doing this kind of thing quickly and fairly easily. What's the patient experience like? Well, this is the best test of all, because all you got to do is hold your breath, you know, for like five seconds, and it's all done. It's, it's, it's the headaches for me, like looking through all that, you know. Uh, but no, uh, you, you, do, you, you have to come in and get an IV, and it has to be a good one, because we use IV contrast to light up the chambers of the heart, so we can get the best pictures. So you would get an IV, and then you would lay on the CAT scan table, and they would scout out the area that they were going to scan, and then they would uh, inject the contrast, and the contrast makes it, gives you a hot flash feeling all over, from your nose to your toes. Almost makes you feel like you wet the bed, I tell people, but you didn't, as far as we know. We'll find out later. Uh, uh, so so when, the, when, the, when everything's set up and the time is right, you know, the technician will, will speak through the microphone. Here comes the contrast. <laughs> and you'd feel that hot flash, and you'd feel it starting just a little bit before the command, because what they're doing is they're tracking that contrast as it moves through the veins, into the right side of the heart, through the lungs, starts to appear into the left side of the heart, and then, bang, this is the moment. So at that appropriate trigger, uh, the, the voice command would say, take a breath and hold it, and boom, a couple seconds later, it's all done. You're finished. Sometimes we can have people come right in from home and have this done uh, if the circumstances are right. But it turns out that the heart rate has to be nice and steady and slow to get the best pictures, especially if you're looking for very fine things. So if a person is already nice and calm and relaxed with a slow heart rate, uh, there are cases where you come, come right in from home, have this done, and leave again. Uh, in, pa in patients where it's very critical to get fine, detailed information and getting the heart rate down might be problematic um, or more difficult, we sometimes have people come into a prep area first and we will have a nurse check the heart rate and the blood pressure and give IV medications in order to reach a certain heart rate target. You know, our dream heart rate is less than 60 beats a minute. If we can get that, we get the best scan with the lowest exposure of x-ray, the finest detail. Uh, so there are some cases where good is good enough, and there are other cases where it has to be perfect. And the case where it has to be perfect is if you're ever going to try to use this machine to look at the arteries that feed the heart non-invasively. So that really pushes the limit of this technology. But it has been done. The most, uh, one of the easiest things you can do with a CAT scanner is you can look at calcium, even without contrast, even without tagging it to the uh, ECG. Uh, when the arteries that feed the heart start to develop cholesterol artery disease, it starts with just soft plaque and then it gradually builds up calcium. So people have taken advantage of this by saying, hey, what if we just pick up flecks of calcium where the arteries of the heart are? And then we develop a scoring system so we can see how much calcium there is. And then we can plot a person in a certain quartile, and we can calculate what their risk is going to be over time. This isn't used that much. Most of the time you can tell whether you're heading for a problem with easier things, like looking at your age and gender and cholesterol levels and blood pressure and things like that. But if you're on the fence about okay, should I start the person on a cholesterol medication or not, kind of on the fence, 
This technique has been used to sort of tip people one way or the other. It's not perfect, though, because you can develop a lot of soft plaque, sometimes a very risky lesion that could rupture and cause a heart attack tomorrow, and it hasn't calcified yet. And so you could walk out of the scanner thinking you're invincible and then have the big one the next day. So it kind of can burn you that way. It can give you false reassurance. Also, calcium doesn't mean it's blocked. So you can have tons of calcium, but the arteries open on the inside and it's getting plenty of blood flow. So what is it really telling you that you didn't already know? Insurance companies won't pay for this. So that's usually the clue that it really, like, there's other ways to do this. Okay? They, they will do this for cash pay uh, if you want to give it to your loved ones as a Christmas <laughs> gift. But, but you have to be very, you have to counsel people about what it really is, the information they're really getting. You don't want them to have false reassurance either. Okay? So if your doctor says take Lipitor, take it, goddamn. All right. So here's some examples. I have to show these. These are examples of when you can get good images of the arteries that feed the heart, which ordinarily would require an invasive cardiac catheterization to do. That's a test where they numb up the skin over the artery in your arm or your leg, and they run a catheter up under x-ray to the arteries that feed the heart. They inject x-ray dye down those arteries selectively, and they take an x-ray movie while they're doing it. For decades, people have been trying to find a less invasive way to do that, but to try to catch these little things that move all the time, that are three millimeters uh, deep in the chest, has been very, very, very challenging. But there are some cases now where we can use this machine, and this is these images are not uncommon to what we can get on our machine right here, right now, at Concord Hospital in the right situation. You can actually map these vessels uh, in a way that looks very similar to how they look in the cath lab. And you can identify uh, anomalies. This guy was born with an artery that comes off the wrong side. Uh, you know, and you can do it in 3D. So you can really describe a lot about those vessels. But the caveat is, the older you get, and the longer you've had atherosclerosis smoldering along in your arteries, like most of us, the more they calcify on the walls, and then you can't see inside of them. So the very person that you're most worried about, you wind up with a mess that you can't interpret. This kind of test is best if you're looking for an anomaly in a younger person, or you have a worried well person. Somebody who's like, I think I have a heart problem. But you know, they probably don't. They're relatively young. They don't have a lot of risk factors. You keep sending them for stress tests. They keep telling you, even though the stress test looks OK, that they think they're having chest pain. They think they're going to have a heart attack. Well, those are the patients where actually you can get a very satisfying result with a technique like this. Uh, they can walk in, get a scan, walk out, and you can say, there you go. It's normal. So that takes a lot of thought. Uh, if I do a CAT scan on somebody who's 70 years old, who has smoked in the past, who has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and sugar diabetes, I will guarantee it will just be a full metal jacket of calcium. And I'll say, I don't know, can't see inside that. Because, you know, calcium blocks x-ray. So I'll see the calcium, but I won't see the inside of the artery. And then I don't know, is it blocked or not? I don't know. You're right back where you started. Now I'm sending you for a stress test. Now I'm sending you for a catheter test anyway. Now I'm giving you extra medical x-ray when I didn't really need to do that in the first place. So your doctors have to really think hard about this. These technologies are available, and you can always do it, but is it going to take you the next step along the way? That's all I'll say about that. Here's just another example of how you can literally walk down the artery and look at the inside using the, these sophisticated software programs. Here's one where there's a lot of calcium built up in the, this part of the artery, and so it sort of blooms and obscures the middle of the vessel, making it nearly impossible to tell 
whether there's a blood flow through there or not. Here's a, here's a CAT scan where the person has no calcium, that soft plaque situation that I was telling you about. Very dramatic example where up here, see this grayish stuff right there? There's a little bit of calcium, maybe this little dot here. That is a big angry plaque right there blocking that artery. And sure enough, in the cath lab, when they inject the dye, it's nearly completely occluded there. So just some kind of cool examples. Uh, there's ways now to try to measure how efficiently the blood is getting through these vessels with CAT scan, kind of like a, a combination of anatomy and flow, like you might get uh, with the nuclear test, but then also with the anatomy test. Uh, so we, there's uh, ways of doing that. And then lastly, uh, quickly, uh, CMR. Uh, cardiac MRI is another way of imaging the heart. Doesn't perform very well in terms of looking at the arteries of the heart, but performs as good, if not better, in many ways for anatomy, function, and flow of the heart. And MRI, you, you may know, it works with magnets and radio waves. It doesn't use medical x-ray at all. You know, I mean, it's important to recognize that, you know, we have x-ray exposure just living for a year on Earth. So we don't want to get too carried away, but on the other hand, all of us in the medical community need to be responsible about how much x-ray we're delivering to get the answer we're looking for. And if we have a technology that can give us that answer with no x-ray, maybe we ought to think about doing that. Uh, so again, CMR, uh, anybody had an MRI scan? One, see one. So you know it's loud. It's a relatively confined space. It's not the end of the world, uh, but some people really have a hard time being in that confined space. Uh, and it, it also takes longer. What is the patient experience? Well, to do an MRI of the heart, a complete MRI study, so I'm studying function, flow, anatomy, and viability of the heart muscle, that could take me 45 minutes, almost an hour. And every time I take a picture of the heart, it's like one slice at a time. And every time I take a picture of the heart, you have to hold your breath. Because the heart moves up and down in the chest when you breathe. And that thing's got to stay still. It's already bad enough that I have to account for the heartbeat. Okay? So the, the breath holds have to, you have to hold your breath while the machine builds the image over about six or seven heartbeats. So depending on what your heart rate is, that could be, you know, 10, 12 seconds long, right? It's not, you know, a diver's breath hold, but it's a breath hold. Yeah, and you've got to do that over and over and over again for each and every slice, for each and every image. Uh, so you've got to pay attention, you've got to hold your breath. We sometimes give sedatives if people are anxious about going in the magnet, but if we go too far and they fall asleep, We've just lost the opportunity. So yeah, we've had we've had it happen. You know, these guys. Oh, I'm so anxious. You know, so you give them a little Valium and they take three instead of one and they show up. And, you know, it's the end of that. Uh, okay, but if you can do this, uh, it, it it returns some very incredible images of the heart. Considering these these actually these pictures are taken with no contrast, so not even an IV, and no x-ray at all. And, and it's like, it's amazing. Okay, so this is, and this, this technique is, 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 is more, it's technician demanding, like the echo, like I was talking about, because the technician here needs to know what the angles of the heart are, and what chambers you're looking for and what techniques you want to use to, to evaluate this, that, and the other thing. It's a step and shoot. It's an on the fly. It's a service that happens that evolves as it goes on. So for the patient, you have to come in, you have to take your shirt off again, and you have to get EKG stickers put on because the machine has to be able to account for the beat of the heart. And the signal coming from the heart gets altered by the magnetic field in the scanner, which can give us fits, because here we are trying to record this teeny-weeny little millivolt signal, 
and all it takes is a little bit of disruption uh, from the magnet magnets in the room and it'll scramble the signal so they're very uh, fastidious about prepping the skin I mean they almost like rub it with sandpaper you know, uh, and they use these special you know made stickers that are super tight uh, and less likely to get altered by uh, more insulated from the magnetic fields uh, to do that and then they'll put a, a receiving coil on your chest which is like the life jacket that a uh, water skier might use it's it's not super thick but it's sort of like that, and that's so that when the signal's bouncing back from the heart to the scanner to form the image, it has a limited distance to go. So we can collect that information more efficiently and accurately. And then after all that, did I talk about the IV? For some cases, we give a contrast. You get an IV, and then they'd slide you into the scanner, and they'd say, you feeling okay? And they'd ask you what music you want playing. Sometimes they can play you music. Uh, and they give you a little button to press if you don't want to be in there anymore. It makes a horrifically loud sound in the control room. Nobody can ignore it. And they come rushing right in. Now with MRI, every image is pretty much built on the one you did before. So if you're in there for 45 minutes for an hour study and you suddenly bail, you kind of have to start all over again to get the last bits. So it's very important to pee before you go in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, just more cool pictures. Um, I think, remember I showed you the CAT scan with the tumor in the heart? This person has the same type of thing. And here's how it images out on MRI. I mean, it, and, it's, and it's functional as well as anatomic. So you can see it like wiggling around in there. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Now, uh, what this is, here's a live shot of contrast going in. And what it's doing is it's lighting up the chambers. And because the contrast isn't going into the tumor, the tumor stays dark. See that? OK? If this was a clot, it would stay dark because it's not getting any blood flow. But if it's a tumor, it has little vessels growing into it to keep it alive. And so what we'll do is we'll then image again about three minutes later and again about five minutes later. And I don't know if you can tell from back there, but it starts picking up the contrast in this sort of variegated way. You see that? And uh, the, the size, the location, the anatomy, and the characteristics of this uh, baseball uh, to all of those experiments, as it were, can walk us down a pathway of logic to tell exactly what that thing is without having to do a biopsy, which would have really been the only option back in the day. Oh, I think there's a marble in the chest. Let's open her up and take it out and see what it is. So MRI can really tell us what it is ahead of time. This happens to be something called a left atrial myxoma, which is technically a benign tumor, except it's just in a bad location, right? I mean, it's obstructing things. So it can cause symptoms, it can cause problems. Sometimes, because it's like a little jelly ball almost, uh, with ragged edges, it can also be a nidus for clot, and pieces of clot can form and then flip off and go up and cause strokes and things. So. These are benign as far as like they don't metastasize like a aggressive tumor, but they cause problems, you know, with obstruction and possibly risk of stroke. And so generally when these are identified, a surgeon will go in and take these out. Okay, I know I've run way past time, but MRI can also evaluate flow curves in any vessel in any orientation, which is pretty awesome. If you wanted to check for shunts or holes in the heart or blocked or leaky valves. Uh, we can also look at how the heart muscle picks up uh, that contrast as well, and there are techniques for identifying blocked arteries to the heart using MRI that have been based on this concept. And now it's gone to a different function. 
And uh, one of the other beauties of this technique is if you wait about five minutes, the contrast will wash in and then wash out of healthy muscle, but it'll stick in areas of scar or inflammation. And so it's like almost a way of studying the actual tissue of the heart. If you recall, there's none of the other methods I've talked to you about all hour can do this. This is unique. Uh, we, can, we can identify particular scar patterns that will tell us if there's injured heart, if there's inflamed heart, and if so, what is it that probably did that? Um, so different diseases cause different patterns. Uh, here's an example of somebody that had a heart attack in this area of the heart, and that, that is picking up scar, this white line right across the tip of the heart. All right. So that was like just a whole case I was going to show. So there you are, guys. Way too much time, but a pretty much whirlwind tour of uh, non-invasive cardiac imaging from as simple as an EKG to as complicated um, and comprehensive as an MRI of the heart. Any questions? <laughs> we all got something. Yeah. I think they were passing out at times. Yeah, and especially. Uh, those are two different patients, actually. Uh, this one of the MRI was our patient, and I think they were passing out, especially when they were dehydrated, because then, um, you know, the, the, the chamber would sort of shrink around that tumor, and the blood was kind of not efficiently getting through that chamber. Yeah, tumors in the heart statistically are incredibly rare. People love to show them at conference because they're cool. But, you know, don't leave here thinking, oh my God, I got a tumor in my heart, please. <laughs> You know, I think if you have a question or a concern, it, 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 it's not always the heart. You know, I mean, you want to start, unless you have something obvious, crushing, chest pain, call 911, okay? But, you know, if, if, if you're just not feeling like you had felt before, you know, that could be a million things. And, uh, you know, we have a great primary care base here that would just take a general look. Okay, what are your blood counts? Are you anemic? You know, are you sleeping okay? You know, there's a lot of things that you want, a lot of bases you want to cover before you're bringing all of this stuff to bear. I would say the highest volume of tests that we do would be stress tests and echoes, and 90% of the time it turns out it's okay. You know, so nobody wants to be blowing this stuff off either. You know, it's not like they don't think about it, but I think we also, in, on our side, where we're doing a lot of cardiac tests and 90% of them are okay, uh, you know, sometimes we're in this position where we're, we're able to tell the patient what it isn't, but we still haven't told them what it is. Uh, and this is also common. I just had a conversation this morning, because I'm on the hospital service today. I turned my beeper off for this lecture. Uh, <laughs> but there's someone covering. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I was just talking to somebody this morning about this. You know, they said, well, uh, you're going to do this test, and what if it is in my heart? What is it? <laughs> you know, and the answer is, you know, it could be any of 20 things. Uh, and her experience is common, which is when you get into the hospital system, uh, the strategy is very different. It's not so much diagnostic. It's rule out the bad stuff and get them home. You know, let the let the outpatient world figure it out. So yes, there's an intense concentration on the thing that could kill you. And then when that's ruled out, it's like, you know, see you later. But the technology that they have developed is amazing. Oh, no question. And, you know, it, it, and, and it's all here, which is amazing. Like the breadth, um, 
of, of services and technologies that we have was purpose built, carefully built, responsibly built, okay, but in very, very comprehensive. So there's really nothing you're going to miss. We were the first place in the state to do cardiac MRI. Um, you know, and CT uh, also one of, one of the first. Um, so these, the, you've got pretty great resources here. I know, I'm not trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> you did the advocating very early on for like a 10, 15 year future ACL clinic, which has been exciting now. Yeah, and we get referrals from all over the state, you know, because if you've been doing it for a long time and people know it, uh, it's not just within our hospital system, it's also outside cities. Yes. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fabulous. Okay. And if you make me do it again, I'm going to use the same exact slide, so you better wait. Okay, on behalf of the entire Concord Hospital Trust staff, I want to thank everyone for coming out today, for joining us for this uh, very special program. Uh, we are happy we had the opportunity to share information with you about our wonderful Cardiovascular Institute. You know, by all means, share the information with friends and family and, and let them know all these great resources we have here. Um, I want to invite you to return to What's Up Doc next month in August. Uh, Dr. Christopher Roberts um, from Radiation Oncology Association affiliated with the uh, Concord Hospital Patient Center for Cancer Care will be here and his topic is navigating a cancer diagnosis. So that should be uh, uh, very insightful. Uh, please stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy a great summer. Thank you.